Good morning. I'll allow for a few more uh, seconds for people to join remotely our celebration of Justice Cruz Reynoso's life. Give everyone a 30 second warning to get online. When do you know when you go? Good morning. Welcome again to the celebration of life of Justice Cruz Reynoso. I speak on behalf of the Supreme Court to welcome all of you and to start our program by saying that uh, Justice Cruz Reynoso, a revered member of our court and credible mentor in the legal profession, as well as a distinguished voice in law, uh, is a person who this court and many others um, grieve his passing. At this point, uh, before I introduce our distinguished speakers, I'd like to turn uh, the program over to Justice Cuellar. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, and thank you to our guests, to members of the Reynoso family, to Dean Kevin Johnson, to Judicial Appointment Secretary Luis Céspedes, Justice Grodin. It's really an honor to be here with all of you, and it's a sad and difficult, but also celebratory moment. So I want to take you back to 2004. Um, at that point, I was two and a half years into law teaching, and I was asked to present one of my papers at UC Davis Law School. Out past the vineyards I drove, thinking about something all teachers think about at some point, which is the student evaluations I'd just received. I was just learning back then how no matter how many forms I read said, great class, you could feel pretty sad for days after reading just one evaluation that said something like, I'll never forget this class. It was twice as long as I would have wanted and half as interesting as I expected. So I started my presentation at King Hall. All I could think about was trying to be twice as interesting and half as long as anybody expected. Until a dignified figure with a warm smile walked in the room and sat at the end of the table. After that, all I could think of was, holy cow, that's California Supreme Court Justice Cruz Reynoso. I'd never met the first Latino Supreme Court Justice in California until then, but I knew some of his story, which had inspired me for years, going back to when I was on a high school mock trial team in the same Imperial Valley where Justice Reynoso once worked. I felt like a basketball fan practicing a three-pointer at a gym and seeing Steph Curry walk in, or like a budding evidence aficionado asked to talk about hearsay who suddenly sees Justice Carol Corrigan walk into the room. Justice Reynoso was characteristically patient, and encouraging afterwards. I was so starstruck, I think I even asked him to autograph a copy of my paper. Dean Johnson will forgive me for saying that one of the main reasons I often found myself trying to find excuses to go to UC Davis again was to see Cruz. Our conversations touched on the tension between academia and the proverbial real world. We discussed what it was like to be a judge, which seemed a calling as honorable as it was exotic to me back then. He'd remind me that most of what people ever remembered about what they read or heard was the stories of their lives and livelihoods, their dreams and disappointments. Looking in the background, of course, was his own story. It spanned deserts and farms, cities and courtrooms. It was a reflection of California's own story, sometimes searing, sometimes heartening. As a kid, he navigated a family where he was one of 10 siblings. From an early age, he picked Orange County's namesake fruits off trees in an as an agricultural worker in the hot La Habra summers. He attended a segregated elementary school. He served in an army counterintelligence unit. 
He practiced law in the Imperial Valley at a pivotal moment and was just about the only attorney representing farm workers who spoke Spanish. He led California rural legal assistance with distinction at a time of great tumult and loved his family throughout. Years later, after serving as a law professor and appellate justice, he brought his mix of superb lawyering and lived experience to this very court. He wrote the landmark opinion, People v. Aguilar, where the court held that the California Constitution required non-English speaking individuals accused of committing a crime to have access to the assistance of an interpreter during the entire proceeding. His eloquence was evident not only in judicial opinions, but in his warnings against efforts to politicize the judiciary. Perhaps though, what was most striking about him was what so floored me about him when I met him at UC Davis, his humble, magnetic, quiet dignity, the sense that he could listen and speak to almost anyone with warmth, candor, and respect. His opinion spoke with just as much candor and respect. Here he is in Aguilar acknowledging in 1984 some core realities about California that guide the work of our judicial branch to this day. In the ethnic richness of California, he wrote, a multiplicity of languages has been nurtured. Historically, many people speaking diverse tongues have formed large portions of our population. The people of this state, through the clear and express terms of their constitution, require that all persons tried in a California court understand what is happening to them, for them, and against them. Who would have it otherwise? That he chose to treat that question as a rhetorical question speaks volumes. In the Spanish language that Justice Reynoso grew up speaking, cruz means cross, as in the ones he often had to bear, and isn't far from the word cruzar, which means to cross, as in the divides he regularly traversed. Reynoso means someone with the qualities of royalty. It is a name as ironic as it is fitting. For one who toiled for decades in these vineyards and taught so many of us a class of sorts that was twice as interesting as I expected, but half as long as I would have wanted. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Cuellar. We have four distinguished speakers. Introduce them starting with our California Supreme Court Associate Justice, Joseph R. R. Groden, retired. Justice Groden. Thank you, Chief Justice, and may it please this honorable court. I very much appreciate the opportunity uh, to share with you uh, my recollections of our recently deceased colleague, Justice Reynoso. Uh, Bruce was appointed to this court about a year before me, and we served together until we were both removed, along with Chief Justice Rose Byrd, in the retention election of 1986. Cruz was the first Latino to be appointed to this court, making it the most diverse court in the nation. The value of that diversity displays itself in a variety of ways. Sometimes it can be found in opinions apparently informed by the judge's prior background, as, for example, in Justice Reynoso's richly reasoned decision holding in people against Trevino that unsupported challenges to persons with Hispanic surnames in jury selection violates due process. And in the case that Justice Cuellar discussed, people against Aguilar, holding on the basis of the state constitution that the right of an English-speaking criminal defendant to an interpret a non-English-speaking criminal defendant to an interpreter is so important that it extends throughout the proceedings. More often, however, the significance of diverse backgrounds is visible only to the other justices, such as through insights and arguments expressed in conference. And of course, Justice Reynoso's contributions to the work of the court went stemming from his ethnicity. In a short tenure, he contributed to the court's jurisprudence in a variety of significant ways. In People Against Beeman, for example, 
He led a unanimous court in resolving a question holding that in order to commit a crime, he must have people's intent. Justice Grodin. Thank you, Justice Grodin. I'm sorry, we lost uh, some yes. communication, but please proceed, sir. I see you've turned off the video. Okay. This whole technology. I apologize. No apologies needed. Uh, contribute. Um. Excuse me, I have a demon. Uh, a police associate. It's an opinion which found. Justice Grodin, I'm sorry to interrupt. You, uh, you appear to be uh, cutting in and out in terms of the our ability to hear you. Um, I will, at this time, Justice Gordon, we do want to capture all of your remarks. If you do not object, I will ask our tech people to help and assist if we are able to. And in the meantime, in order to capture all of your comments, I would pass you at this time uh, while we are able to improve your feed, sir, and have you present after the next speaker. And I will send a message to our tech folks, sir, to see if we okay. can get you back on track. So, because it, it's it's uh, it's somewhat fitting, is it not, that in 2021, as we have made the transition to remote technology, we haven't quite made it fully. Um, the technical difficulties that we are experiencing now, at least I can say personally, it happens on a regular basis. So I think uh, Justice Reynoso is probably laughing at us at this point, and rightly so, but we are striving to stay in the moment. At this time then, passing Justice Grodin, but hoping to get back to him shortly, I would like to introduce a Kevin R. Johnson, Dean of UC Davis School of Law, my alma mater, Dean Johnson. Thank you, thank you, Chief Justice. It's, it's really with true sadness that I, I, I'm honored to say a few words today. Cruz Reynoso is a legend. He was a force for good. He is a wonderful faculty colleague, and he was a friend of mine. And I will miss him, and I think we'll all be diminished by his loss. I'm not gonna dwell on Justice Reynoso's amazing career. You really know all about that. Um, he, he was the head of California Rural Legal Assistance and fought the then governor at a time to keep the organization in place, to fight for justice for the rural poor, to fight for the forgotten. He fought the short-handled hoe, and he fought the deadly pesticide DDT. He literally fought for the lives of farm workers. Cruz Renesa later was a respected law professor at New Mexico, UCLA, and UC Davis. Students loved him. He was a gifted storyteller. He regaled his classes with stories from his law career. He was free with his time and mentored students and alums. Imagine having a Supreme Court justice as a mentor. He was a role model for our students and actively participated in the Loraza Law Students Association. As you all know, he later became a justice on the Court of Appeals in the California Supreme Court. Um, but he was never bitter about the recall. We talked about the recall on a number of occasions. As he put it, philosophically, the outcome was just politics. He later served on the Civil Rights Commission. And among other things, he challenged the voting irregularities in the 2000 election. Now, you all know this generally, but I, what I really want to talk about is Cruz Reynoso as a person. He's perhaps the most decent person that I've ever met. When I first met him in the spring of 1985, we were both walking down the street in the Civic Center 
after a, a lunch, charity lunch for a legal services group. I was with a group of summer clerks on a law firm where I was working. And we ran into a man very briskly walking toward the Supreme Court. He said hello and started talking and talking. Uh, and um, I recognized him. Uh, he talked to all of us like we were our long lost friends. He talked to the summer clerks. Uh, after we went our separate directions, I told the summer clerks who he was, and they were in awe. And, and that was my first meeting with Cruz. Now, years later, I had the pleasure of seeing Cruz Renoso daily. Even though he technically retired in 2006, you could expect to see him bright and early in the office at 7 a.m. each day in a suit with a tie. He rode his bike to work, but he had a lot of work to do. One of his projects was autobiography, which he partially completed. I told him repeatedly they should finish it and offered to have him come to my office each day and dictate 15 minutes and I would type it in the computer. His response is what you'd expect from somebody who's supremely humble. Uh, Kevin, there are more interesting things for me to work on. And we got in the habit of talking most mornings and I still walk by his office many mornings. When the building's quiet, his phone isn't ringing, people aren't stopping by. And he talked about starting his law office in the Imperial Valley, uh, running for the California Assembly, and being attacked as a communist. And he also talked about his famous justice bone. And in my office, he even had one of the posters from, for his run for the Assembly. Um, and um, it didn't work out for him, but he found another career in law. Now, Cruz Reynoso loved his family to do anything for them. When he drove his wife, Janine, monthly from Harold to Los Angeles to see her doctor, she didn't fly, he never complained. He never complained about driving her across country in the summers to family reunions in Tennessee. He just wasn't a complainer. When we were trying to lure Cruz to UC Davis from UCLA, we made sure that Janine joined us for the discussions. They had a ranch in Harold, and he was then working at UCLA. She was central to the discussion. Cruz later liked it when I bragged a bit and said, UC Davis did what the INS couldn't do. We, we re reunite families. We truly were blessed to have Cruz on our faculty. He was the inaugural holder of an endowed chair for the study of freedom and equality. He taught remedies, professional responsibility, advanced civil rights. As I said, he retired technically. Uh, but unlike any faculty member I ever met, he still attended faculty meetings. Uh, he still gave me advice. He consistently argued for lower tuition for students and greater diversity among our students and faculty. He was still our conscience. He was my conscience. He was willing to give to all. He gave to students. He gave to his colleagues. And he gave to staff at the law school. A special showing of the documentary about him, sowing the seeds of justice. He, he, he spoke with the staff for hours after the showing. They were impressed with his devotion. But besides his commitment to, the, to, to his law school community, he still had commitments to the greater community. In retirement, at the request of the president of the University of California, he led a task force that looked into the a 2011 protest event where police on UC Davis campus pepper sprayed students. In retirement, he led another investigation into the police killing of a farm worker in a woodland. In retirement, he reviewed materials for a claim of racial discrimination by the San Francisco police. He was always trying to do something to make his justice bone feel better. He was active and beloved in the Schwartz Le Levy in of court, as well as the Cruz Reynoso Bar Association, which of course is named after him. Put simply, Cruz Reynoso was compelled in a way to keep busy trying to do good even after he's retired. I could go on, but you get the idea. I think we all are fortunate to have known a remarkable and decent person. We will miss him. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Johnson. And next, we invite uh, Luis Cespedes.
Judicial Appointment Secretary to Governor Gavin Newsom. Louise. Thank you, Chief Justice Kanteo Sakauye and members of this distinguished court for allowing me to speak in honor of my dear friend and mentor, the Honorable Cruz Reynoso. Governor Newsom has said Justice Reynoso was, quote, a fierce champion of farm workers, immigrants, and the economically disadvantaged. Justice Reynoso dedicated his over half a century career in public service to California's most vulnerable communities. He was a lauded teacher, beloved community activist, and a trailblazing California Supreme Court justice who never lost sight of the vision for creating a more just and equitable California, end quote. The governor wishes to again offer his sincere condolences to Len and the entire Reynoso family and his many friends throughout California and our nation. I had the privilege of sharing many meals with Justice Reynoso and listened to his life stories that were always told with humor and Spanish phrases tossed in here and there for emphasis. Before his illness, we had arranged to meet in Davis at his favorite Italian restaurant on First Street a half hour before noon because he told me he had an appointment at 1 p.m. and wanted to be on time. Justice Reynoso was always on time. After our meal, I walked with Justice Reynoso through the parking lot toward his car and said, have a good meeting. He turned to me and said, I'm helping a young boy at Woodland Elementary School who speaks only Spanish learn to read. I always look forward to seeing him. As he drove off, I remained standing in the parking lot thinking, what a remarkable man and what a lucky boy. I wondered if this young man knew his tutor was a former intelligence officer in the United States Army, the recipient of the highest medal that can be offered to an American civilian, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and his reading tutor was an advisor to presidents, a civil rights lawyer, and a distinguished jurist on the Third District Court of Appeal, and of course, the first Latino to serve on the California Supreme Court. Or like many, did he simply know him as Cruz, a kind and caring man who smiled often and made him feel special, valued, and hopeful. At another lunch, Justice Reynoso told me the difficult decision he had to make when Governor Brown called to offer him an appointment to the Third District Court of Appeal and leave his farm in New Mexico, where he was teaching law at the University of New Mexico. He told me he was very unsure whether to accept this tremendous opportunity. I asked, why? Were you concerned about the challenge? He said, no, I just need to figure out how to get my children's animals to California, including their many chickens, rabbits, and a donkey. Justice Reynoso steadfastly believed in judicial independence, the rule of law, and our state and federal constitutions. As Justice Grodin and Justice Quire have just said, it was in 1984 in People v. Aguilar, this court addressed the question of whether a criminal defendant, Mr. Marcelo Aguilar, had a right to an interpreter throughout the judicial proceeding. Justice Reynoso wrote for the majority, and if I can indulge the court, I love to hear his voice. Quote, the right of a criminal defendant to an interpreter is based on the fundamental notion that no person should be subjected to a Kafkaesque trial which may result in the loss of freedom and liberty. In the ethnic riches of California, a multiplicity of languages has been nurtured. Historically, many people speaking diverse tongues have formed large portions of our population. The people of this state, through the clear and express terms of their constitution, require that all persons in California court understand what is happening about them, for them, and against them. Who would have it otherwise? In 2011, the National Hispanic Bar Association gave Justice Reynoso the Lincoln Juarez Legal Award in honor of contemporary presidents, 
Abraham Lincoln and Benito Juarez, who were born under humble circumstances, became lawyers and changed the world. It is fitting that the Honorable Cruz Reynoso be so honored having lived a life of humility, empathy, courage, intelligence, and an unwavering commitment to judicial independence, which is the cornerstone of our democracy and justice for all. As Governor Newsom said, Cruz Reynoso was beloved by many. He is for the ages now and will be missed forever. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, the art of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Justice Reynoso's life of service helped bend that arc so that the little boy he tutored and all our children living in our society may become anything they wish, even a California Supreme Court justice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cespedes. I believe now we have uh, Justice Grodin on the phone. Justice Grodin, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, well, um, I'm not quite sure where I left off, but it really doesn't make any difference. Uh, I began my re remarks by referring to uh, the retention election of 1986, in which Justice Grodin, along with, excuse me, Justice Reynoso, along with uh, Chief Justice Byrd and myself, uh, lost our seats on the court to the will of the people. Uh, it was characteristic of Cruz that he never seemed to be angry at the people or groups who opposed his retention on the court. He often said it was nothing personal, rather the product of profound misunderstanding, aided by misleading propaganda, and undertaken for reasons mostly political in nature. I've referred to Cruz as a gentle giant, respectful of the views of others, but firm and forceful about his own convictions. For Cruz, the election was simply one more battle in a lifetime pursuit of justice. He may have lost that particular battle, but in a very real sense, taking into account his overall achievements, we can say he went on to win the war. Thank you, Justice Grodin. Next, uh, we have the pleasure of hearing from Mr. Len Reed Reynoso. Good morning, Madam Chief Justice. And uh, please the court, um, good morning to all. As I said, I'm Len Reed Reynoso. I'm one of Cruz's children. We ha Dad had four children in his family. Uh, my eldest sister is named Trina, Renin, myself, and my younger brother, Rondel. Dad had two wives uh, throughout his life. My mother, Janine, uh, Dad and Janine were married for over 50 years before she passed away with cancer and then was married to uh, Elaine for 11 years. Dad and mom had 17 grandchildren. There's two great-grandchildren now, and there's a third grandchild, great-grandchild on the way. Dad also, with his second marriage, had two stepchildren with their spouses and three step-grandchildren there. As we've been talking about today, many of you know Dad's public life very well. But there was a private side to his life as well, and usually the private side of his life dealt with teaching. Uh, the different speakers today have talked about several different issues. One was the retention election. I can remember as a young person, I was at the Arcoe Elementary School where we had the party after the retention election, and the results were coming in, and Dad was not winning. And I went to him and said, hey, Dad, you don't seem as upset as I thought you might be, because the court meant a lot to him. And he says, I had a million people vote for me. How can I be upset when a million people support me? The next day after the election, uh, dad and mom actually went on a, a, 
an event up to just the mountains. They went to a, have a lunch up in the foothills, and Dad and Mom described it later as probably one of the most pleasant days that they've ever had. He had just lost his major election, but he got to spend my uh, time with his family. We had trouble with technology earlier today. Dad was not a fan of technology, as was mentioned. He used to have these cases that he worked at my um, office, and he would ask the, the law firms to provide him with paper copies of everything. That would often shock the attorneys, uh, and my office would end up with 20 file boxes of documents for him to review. So he was not a particularly fan, fond of, of a lot of the technology issues. Um, Dean Johnson mentioned Dad's memoirs as far as his um, writing them and trying to draft them up for him. He was very particular in how he wanted to do that, so he only made it for the first six chapters, which, which we have, which is kind of fun. It was also mentioned about his um, desire to come to California and worry about the animals. We actually packed up all our animals in a four um, horse trailer, I believe it was, four horse horse trailer. <laughs> And across, it was a trailer was owned by a local um, feed store owner that we bought all our feed store for, uh, animal feed at. And the owner was actually going to Oregon or something. So dad made arrangements and mom made arrangements for him to haul our horses, our goats, our um, like rabbits, um, everything we had to California. So when we showed up at the ranch in, in Harold, we opened our barn doors and all the critters were all there for us already. It was a lot of fun. Um, there are a few other examples I'd actually written down about um, Dad's life and things that we learned through what he had taught us. Uh, before I was born, Dad did run for the State Assembly in El Centro, California in 1964. My nephew reminded us at the family memorial services we had for Dad a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, that everyone should run for public office at least once. And if you're fortunate, you will lose. Later in the 1960s and 70s, Dad led CRLA. Dad worked with dozens of attorneys to help the farm workers. These attorneys went on to take positions with various law firms and government agencies. When I interned at the Department of Water Resources over 20 years ago, at least two of my supervising attorneys at DWR had worked with Dad at CRLA. I learned the value of training good people. In 1976, Dad left the University of New Mexico School of Law and accepted the court appointment to the third DCA in Sacramento. While at the third Court of Appeal, uh, Dad would often work at home drafting opinions and diagramming sentences. Dad, my mom Janine, did teach all the children how to diagram sentences. Dad wanted his opinions to be clear, so he wanted his grammar to be clear. However, dedication to sentence structure was sometimes the cause of issues. While at the third DCA, he and then presiding Justice Puglia got into a debate about dangling participles. This discussion lasted until the other judges at the Third District Court of Appeal had said, we've had enough. The memos were circulated telling Justice Puglia and Dad to stop the debate. We not only have Dad's oral history that taught us the story, but in going through his over 2,000 file boxes of paperwork, we have several of the memos sent between the justices. I learned the importance of diagramming sentences. In the 1970s and 1980s, we would travel across country to visit cousins in Tennessee. What did Dad and I talk about while I was Dad's co-pilot? Co-pilot really meant that I was the one getting him ice and making sure he had sunflower seeds. <laughs> we talked about immigration policy, immigration history, how to treat people fairly. In all the weeks of driving over the years, I was still learning about immigration policies from my father. In the early 1980s, both while on the Third District Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, I was on the Galt High School FFA Agriculture Farm Records team. While I had practiced, Dad would come in to pick me up from the high school. If I was not done practicing yet with the team, Dad would simply go into the ag office, pull out his files, and start studying. Years later, all three ag teachers at different times told me how impressed they were that Dad both supported my activities while working at the same time. I learned that people watch what we do and how we do it. When I was in my late teens, I was with Dad at the Supreme Court building in San Francisco. It was time to go home. Dad cost, tossed me the keys and told me to drive. I had never driven in San Francisco before, and it was rush hour. With Dad's encouragement, I made it to the Bay Bridge. While on the bridge, Dad told me to watch out for that car that was darting in and out of traffic. When we reached the Oakland side of the bridge, Dad asked if I had kept an eye on the darting car. I said I had, and it was three cars in front of us. I learned to have faith in those we train and not to endanger other people on the highway. In the early 
uh, sorry, early 2000s, Dad had been a co-chair of the Civil Rights Commission for over a decade. Dad flew all over the country for the commission, but Mom would not fly. So Dad had a tremendous number of frequent flyer miles, enough to, to fly many of the family to D.C. for an adventure, kids, spouses, and grandchildren. However, some did take trains, and the closer folks drove. Not everyone was flew that time. However, pardon me. Sorry, I have my own technical difficulty. Sorry, buzzer went off that I thought I had off. I apologize to the court. Um, when we went to D.C., Dad and Mom took us to where they met. They met in D.C. when Dad was working for the counterintelligence and Mom was working for the FBI. Dad spoke about when he had to walk home when Martin Luther King was assassinated because D.C. had closed down. Uh, when it was time to take the White House tour, the family had to check in. And back then, I think as now, you have to have members of Congress check you into the White House. Dad had taught enough people. They did not have a problem finding enough Congress persons to check in about two dozen family members into the White House for the tour. Dad and Mom taught us about our family history. Dad also was able to work with my law office from 2013 to 2018. We got to help, we got Dad, got to help Dad explain California law to the Israeli Supreme Court. We worked on issues with shoe companies fighting about international contracts in Spain. We helped Dad with issues dealing with the LA school system. All the time Dad was helping those folks, he was also doing his pro bono work. The deal with my office was that Dad could do any of the pro bono work he wanted as long as we didn't have a conflict of interest. Dad taught me how to be a better attorney. When Dad was winding down his career, I was able to travel with Dad to several events. One of the events, an annual event at Pomona College, Dad gave an interview in which he was asked what his favorite job was. Dad responded that the favorite job he had ever had was on the California Supreme Court, and that was because he was able to help the most people. Dad had worked on social justice issues for eight decades, but the job he enjoyed the most was a job that he was able to help and serve the most. Dad continued to teach us the value of helping others. Dad was also called a professor for most of his life. As a child, it was an insult. As an adult, he was a professor at three different law schools, University of New Mexico, UCLA, and UC Davis. Dad turned the conflict into success. Dad loved almost all the jobs he had, especially the job of being a judge and a law professor. I learned to try to love what you do and turn your lemons into lemonade. I will miss. I miss learning from my father. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Reed Reynoso. We're all going to miss your father. All the comments here today have been moving and interesting and, and humorous to some extent. I find your personal account of life and lessons from your father with your family to be uh, deeply moving and precious. Thank you for sharing them with us at this memorial. In closing, I would say my experience with uh, Justice Cruz Reynoso is like all described here. When I was on the Court of Appeal at the Third District, he reached out, we broke bread, we had dinner, and I was moved by his warmth and his kindness and his wisdom, and that he talked so freely about issues with no anger, no angst, uh, but from a place of education and a place of understanding. And I remember how kind he was to me and some of the interesting questions we discussed about leadership and politics. When I became Chief Justice, he reached out because, of course, he's always keen on access to justice. And he came up with several ideas for improvement of the Supreme Court. And I remember going to UC Davis Law walking into his office to have long discussions with him about the kinds of changes he thought we might pursue, that we did investigate and did research. We continued that kind of conversation where he brought uh, to us ideas of how to improve access, how to make it more efficient, how to speed it up. 
because he always cared about justice. And even though he didn't serve as continue to serve publicly on the California Supreme Court, in so many, many, many ways, he did more because he reached out and influenced lives previously in his work before he became to the bench, but also as a professor, as a friend, as a community member, as a respected advocate, as a respected jurist and referee who was tasked with some of the most high profile and sensitive reports because he had the credibility and the trust and confidence of California to be able to deliver those reports and to have people respect the decisions and recommendations that came from them. We will all miss this extraordinary man. I will say that on behalf of the court, I think we all feel like we know him or knew him very personally just because of who he is and how we know his communication and who has been in touch with him. I think with Cruz Reynoso, there is no six degrees of separation. It's one degree of separation, all of us, and how we think of him and know him. There are many thanks today to be said, not only to our speakers who've shared their lives with him, with us, uh, Justice Cuellar's eloquent recitation of memory of, of Justice uh, Cruz Reynoso, also to Jorge Navarrete, and the Supreme Court for arranging this opportunity for us to commemorate and honor Justice Reynoso, as well as the Judicial Council staff who groans with our tech difficulties, but who perseveres in, in getting this on screen or on the phone. And also to Jake Deere for helping reach out to you to have you speak today. And so as we conclude memoriam sessions with this phrase, in accordance with our custom, it is ordered that this memorial be spread in full upon the minutes of the Supreme Court and published in the official reports of the opinions of this court. Thank you. This concludes our memorial service.